All right, and welcome back to our intro to our series. This is part three, where we just finished converting between object types. And now we're going to move on to all the other cool things you can do. Okay, so let's start with subsetting, because subsetting is going to be sort of a critical skill when doing applying statistics or just general data analysis. And so what is subsetting or indexing, as it's sometimes called? And this is where we are grabbing only the rows, or only the columns, or only the section of a list that we're interested in. And so we've already talked about how to do this kind of with the, the square brackets, indicating which row, which column, or the dollar sign operator. But what if instead of just like the sex column and penguins, I really wanna know, you know, based on some of the data that's available in those columns. So I want to select based on some score or find all of my missing data or some other combination of things. So we're just going to show you a couple of sections and we want to, I mostly want to focus here on how logical operators work. So logical operators are when we ask a question that give us an answer as true or false. So they're considered Boolean operators. And R will return everything that is true and leave out everything that's false. Okay, what it does with missing data is sometimes tricky. Okay. And so we can analyze each row or each column for that logical question that we're asking. And in this particular case, we're gonna ask when bill length of our penguins is greater than 54. And I'll have to scroll down for you to see that here in a second. And then we would only get back the rows where that length is greater than 54. Okay. And you just have to be careful where you put this argument. So as an example to start, let's start with what we know. For penguins, let's get back rows one and two. Remember it's rows comma columns. So just give me rows one and two. So here's row one, here's row two. Okay. It doesn't always print the entire thing here on these markdown documents, um, just to save space. Now what's happening in this section is we're going to look at rows okay. and we're interested in knowing when bill length is greater than 54. So we're going to write a logical question. So bill length greater than the greater than symbol 54. Okay. That's a question that I can search through that bill length column and say, nope, 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 nope. Don't know what's in a nope, nope. And find that bill length column that is greater than 54, which I think is actually this column here. So yes, 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 eh, yes, yes. Okay. Now don't forget, R doesn't know where bill length is. You gotta tell where it is. Even though you're inside the square brackets for that data frame, you still gotta tell it where it is. This is part of the very last section of the last video. And this is like our example of your um, significant other maybe asking you where the keys are. And you're like, I don't know, I'm not you. You have to remember the last place it was. Right? And so you've got to tell it, it's in the penguins data set. Okay. Now how this works is if we take it out here of that rows col uh, comma column section is what it does is it creates what's called a logical vector. Okay, false, 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 N-A, because it doesn't know how to compare a missing data point to 54 is, is missing greater than 54? I don't know. So it just returns missing. False, 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 false. And there'll be a couple of true values somewhere in here. Okay, like here's a true. And so what happens is it graphs this true false column, which is the same length as our data. Scroll up here. And it prints out only the trues and the missing data points. So it printed out this one because it was missing. And then it printed out all of these other ones because they're true. So these are the only penguins with a bill length greater than 54. And once you get the hang of logical operators and creating these questions, you can get very complex. So I want all the penguins that have a bill length greater than 54 and a bill depth greater than 17. And this here, the uh, ampersand, it's above the seven is just the and operator. So this and that. We can also do an or, which is the pipe icon, which is a shift and then the key above the enter key with a backslash. So I could do this or that. 
and then you can keep going this and that or this other thing like you can do a bunch of a bunch of these and so i'm going to say okay i want all the penguins with bill length greater than 54 and bill depth greater than 17 and that reduces us down even more and so that gives us three real columns and two NA columns, which we'll come back to how to deal with those. Scroll, scroll, scroll. Here's another thing I can do, everything but. So if you do the minus symbol in front of a number, at least, um, you can uh, drop everything but. Right? So this is all the columns. This is the column place. Every column but the last one, or but the first one. Sorry, but the first one. So we've dropped that species column. Okay, just notice how it doesn't come up down here. Okay. So every column but the first one, we could do minus one in the front and be all the rows but the first one. So you do have to be careful where you put it in the rows or columns slot. I could grab some columns by their name. So let's say I want bill length and sex, the only two I want left. I could say, well, make me a vector of all the column names I'm interested in and only print out those columns. You can also do that with rows. So I could say I only want rows one through 10 and then put rows here in the front. So we can start to be more creative with how we're calling things. Now there's another base R function called subset. If you're into tidyverse, there's a, this is the filter option. But subset, what it does is it takes the data set and then I can use my same types of arguments, but it's smart. It knows what data set to look in because you've defined the data set as one of the arguments. And so unlike the previous slide where I had to tell it, it's in the penguins data set, dummy, the subset function doesn't require that. And learning these small distinctions is something that just takes a little bit of playing around. If you aren't sure, just always call it penguins bill length. Okay, it won't hurt you. So give me the, the same thing, bill length with 54. And I just really wanna point out the big difference here. Okay, so let me back up. Here's this original version where I subset it by putting it in the square brackets and making a logical argument. Notice that it returns eight, no, sorry, nine rows. Same thing, but now with the subset function, it only returns seven rows. So what gives? The big difference between using the square brackets options and the subset function is that the subset function says, eh, I don't want any NA values. So anything it can't assess, so where the penguin length or the bill length is NA or missing, it just drops them. And so there's different times and places where you want to keep the NAs versus not keep the NAs. And NAs are missing values. So sometimes we're interested in hanging on to them, sometimes not. So speaking of, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about missing values. So they're, they're listed as NAs. Okay. NAN, if you ever see that, stands for not a number, which isn't really a missing value, it's kind of an error. And most functions have some sort of built-in option to deal with NA values. Unfortunately, they can all be slightly different. So there's this cool function called complete cases. And what complete cases does is it tells you if the entire row has some form of data in it. Okay, meaning the case is complete. The whole row has some sort of information in it. And I told it to print out the head here Oops, sorry, we're up here. Head just means print out the first six objects, okay, just so it's not so long. But it says, well, the first three rows all have complete data. That fourth row does not. The five and six here are also complete. Okay. Now that's a true false. So that's a question. Are the, question, are the cases complete? Okay, so that's a logical operator. In a omit here is, is a practical option. So it just omits any NAs. So if the row has an NA value, it's gone. Okay. And so what we see here are the first six rows with no missing data. So this is kind of a quick hack to get rid of all the missing data. 
Now, if I want to ask the question, is it in A? But I don't, I don't want to do rows. I want to do one column at a time. There's a function called is in A that also creates um, a logical one. And realize these are opposite questions. Complete cases is asking, is all the data complete? Is in A is asking, is the data missing? And that's why we get kind of the opposite answers here. So false means the data isn't missing. And true means the data is missing. So to figure out what kind of question it's asking. All right, so with missing data, we can subset to have missing data or not. And then we'll see in a little bit where some of the functions have arguments for missing data. But we're gonna take a quick step off to the side and talk about working directories before we get into like importing data and package functions. Okay. Now, a working directory is a where your computer is looking for something. Okay, we've already talked about how R looks for variables in the current environment. Okay. And you have to remind it where the keys are. Okay. Now, when you want to load a data set or open a file, you have to tell it where on your computer to look. Okay. And your computer has files and folders. If you're one of those like wild people who puts everything in downloads and never cleans out downloads, I am too type A for that. <laughs> I have like folders and folders and folders. <laughs> but if everything's in downloads, that's great. <laughs> it makes it a little easier. But maybe you don't want to do that. Maybe you want to organize your folders by class or something. Okay, so we got to tell it what folder to look in. And the working directory is the folder that R is currently looking in. And there's lots of ways to handle working directories. So I'm going to show you what I think is one of the easiest. And this is after years of <laughs> learning this the hard way. <laughs> okay. And so if I use the, the function get wd, no arguments required, it tells me where I'm currently working. So this file from our, our markdown file is currently saved in my university OneDrive in a folder called teaching, Anley 500, Anley 500, <laughs> flipped, learn R. <laughs> so I have it saved to this like wild place. But let's say you downloaded the notes, which you should do. It's not going to be in that place on your computer. So how do we set the directory for your computer? Okay. Well, one thing you can do is use set WD and then type out that whole path. So this, oh, sorry, this whole thing is considered the file path. That is very error prone. And the instant that you change OneDrive has a meltdown, fairly common, and it's like, nope, that's not my folder anymore. I'm gonna stick everything over here in this other folder with a two at the end. It's gonna break all of those, um, lines of code that you've typed. Okay. So I don't really recommend setting a working directory in your documents. Instead, what I'd recommend is allowing the, using the functionality that RStudio has created for us to always know where to look. Okay. So working directories are critical because it allows me to automate and allows me to share code with you and you get the same answers that I did. Okay. And so instead of using point and click options in like SPSS or any one of these other paid programs, you just say, open the code, hit the button and run. Okay. And so I, way I mostly handle this is through markdown files. Okay. Markdown files, automatically assume the working directory is the same folder that you have that file in. Okay. So for example, this lecture file is in a different folder, <laughs> is in a the folder that you saw before. So let me find that folder real quick. My folders and folders and folders here. Because I'm creating new lectures. Here it is. Okay. So it's it's in this file. Here's that file right there. Okay. So when I go to use this data set here, this example intro R data set in a minute, it's going to assume that that data set is in the same folder. So I don't have to tell it where it is. I just say find this data set. Okay. 
And so that is a really nice thing about markdown files, other than the fact that I can mix and match between code and text so I can write myself from notes and remind myself why I did stuff later um, or write an entire manuscript. Okay. Um, it also is handy because as long as I have those files in the same folder. So when you're working on these class notes and you wanna download the lecture, you download the entire lecture folder, stick it in one folder in your downloads or wherever you like, just keep them together. The other option is what's called a project. Projects are something I like came late to the game on, but I really love. Projects are like a whole collection of things. You can have one project per folder, but generally you have like a project for an overall set of things. And so let me show you an example of that. So right now I'm in the learn stats project, which is the package for this class. But let me switch to a different project. I thought I had it open. Yeah, so I teach uh, natural language processing courses. So I have that one saved as its own project. And when I load that project, it takes me back to wherever I was. So that project, which is just a special type of file here, sticks me into a folder that has both courses. So it has um, our natural language processing course and our human language course all together. And within that project, I also have different markdown files. And so having a project kind of keeps all of these files together. It helps me find where I am in the files here. And because these markdown files are in a specific folder, it also assumes the working directory is part of that um, folder. So right now I tell you to start with markdown files and just make sure everything stays in the same folder. But projects are also very handy. All right, and then in doing that, of course, I've lost the lecture notes. <laughs> Again, why do I keep closing them? I was in the, the other video too. Uh, okay, we were looking at the learn stats package. So my notes should still be open. <laughs> cool, yeah. That's another cool thing about projects. And then we were here. Great. So because of that, now we've talked about working directories, let's talk about importing files. There are lots of ways to import files. I'm gonna show you my absolute favorite one, but if you like other ways, that's fine too. Okay. The, the base R functions include things like read lines or read.csv because CSV is kind of a universal format that a lot of data people like. You can use tidyverse, which is read underscore CSV, read underscore XLSX. <laughs> I think read SPSS, there's, a, there's a, a whole host of functions that allow you to convert different data types into R. R. Um, I've mostly stayed away from those because they converted them to tibbles. And for a long time, I was like strongly anti-tibble. I'm sort of like medium anti-tibble now. <laughs> and it caused problems with some of my packages um, and some of the things I was doing. So those are also great functions. But the, the, there is a, um, to me, a fa fantastic magic wand function. Um, the other thing I can do is use the import data set option. That's here in my environment window. I click import data set. And so I can use um, read.csv here or read lines. And then so a couple of other options. This is part of tidyverse here is in the read R package. The problem with this is it's not reproducible. It only puts it in the console. So you'd have to do it every single time you wanted to open something, which is very tedious. So instead, Let's use the jackknife uh, of all packages as they kind of name themselves, which is Rio. Okay. Rio is just fantastic. I uh, want to thank my friend Ruben for <laughs> introducing me to Rio. It's beautiful. So it's a package that opens nearly every type of data except maybe PDFs possible. And you can always come remember um, and look up what Rio does. So I can type in library Rio. Okay. I can also come over here to packages because we're about to get to this part where I can click on packages. 
and go down to Rio, click, boop, Swiss Army knife, not Jack knife. All right, uh, and see and look at all of their options. Okay. But I know it's the import function, so let's look at that import function. And so it pulls up Rio here and then it explains like what all is happening in Rio, but this is where, where it becomes awesome. So it opens, reads C uh, CSV files, PSV files, tab separated files, SAS, SPSS, Stata, more SAS and Excel, which is one of my favorite things. Um, syntax files, R data files, mini tab, sysstat, just like unbelievable Fortran, number of things, zip files, gzip has been useful for me this last couple of months, JSON, MATLAB, I can't even keep going, and Google Sheets. Okay, It opens nearly everything. If they added PDF to this, I would be like the happiest clan because it's the only other thing that I've tried to open that they, it doesn't do. Okay. Here's what I love most about Rio is I don't generally have to think very hard. The function is import, then the name of the file. No big long path. It assumes it is in the same folder as everything else. And I just have to make sure I spell it right. <laughs> okay, because that's the other big, big problem. Okay. Now, um, it reads the file in, interprets what file type it probably is, and then imports it. 99% okay. of the time, it gets it perfectly right. If when you print out a little bit of it, it doesn't quite look right. You can add more arguments to get it right. And so that happens when, let's say you have, let's say you work with Qualtrics and you accidentally downloaded that file that has like three header rows. Okay, you're gonna have to give it some extra hints on how to read that kind of file. Or um, you have a tab separated file and it misinterpreted some of the tabs. You can give it a little bit more information to clear that out. But like I said, I've rarely had to do that. I just said import and it read it. Okay. This is really great for Excel sheets. This is really great for SPSS data because unless you have SPSS, otherwise you can't open it. Okay. I love Rio. So import, look at our data. Okay. So this is data for um, an example for another class that just has people rating how they feel about words. Okay. And so it's an easy way to import a data set. One line of code. Now I've been talking a lot about packages. Like what the heck is a package? So R comes with this base set of functionality. I've talked a lot about base R. This is what comes when you install R. And there's a bunch of stuff that's already there, but it is not enough. So people have written extra add-ons or functionality called packages. And this class uses a specific package to help kind of organize all of our stuff together. So packages can be a collection of functions, can be a collection of data, it just can be a collection of random thoughts. <laughs> but generally it's a collection of functions, usually centered around a specific topic. So we've written a couple packages, like one of, one of mine that we'll use is a package for effect sizes okay, that runs all the math for that. Okay. And so when you install them, they're called packages. When you load them, they're called libraries. And I have always hated this distinction. It's very confusing to students. Package, library, same thing. Okay. It's an add-on component to your R. Okay. These are often downloaded from what's called CRAN. This is the central R repository. It's like, it's like the, the network of all of the approved R packages. Okay. And by approved, we mean that you've gone through the, the um, the loop, uh, loops, hoops, hoops, flaming hoops. You've jumped through the hoops um, that the network of CRAN folks have required. It does not mean that they have like tabulated your math and said that every statistical function or every whatever you've put in is correct. Okay, there are errors and bugs in these things. They're written by humans. Um, but a package in CRAN just means that it has met certain rules. Okay, and this, a lot of them are about spelling. <laughs> so, you know, you want to make sure the packages you use are appropriate too. Okay. And you can download and install them with install.packages. And this will be like the one and only time I will tell you to not use code, but because it's easier to click and install them. Because once you install them, you don't have to do it again. So this is not something you have to reproduce. Somebody else just has to install it themselves. 
We won't talk about the problem that packages change over time. We'll cover that a different day. And we can also install them by using the packages tab. So let's do that. Okay. So I'm gonna click packages. Look at this little install button right here. You can tell it I want to get it from CRAN. Most, you know, like nearly 100% of the time you want to do this. I'm just going to tell it to install car. I have car already, but it won't hurt me. So I'm going to click car here. But the cool thing about CRAN is as you start typing, our package is called moat. It'll pull up the options that it's aware of. So if as you're typing, one of the best packages I'm aware of is Papaya. It's a package that allows me to write my manuscripts in R. It's not in CRAN yet. He's working on it. Hopefully by the time this cycles through a couple of classes, uh, this will be out of date, but um, it's not in CRAN yet. Rants. Okay. So let's do car here. Click enter. Okay. What that does is it types the code out for me and then says, uh, you've already got this installed. Okay. Otherwise it cloaks through and goes through and installs. Now, sometimes installation doesn't go right because your computer doesn't have something else it needs. And so the error messages there will hopefully help you work that out. Now, other packages can be installed from GitHub and some other places. So I'll show you how to install a GitHub package for the classroom materials. Okay. Now, I can look at all the packages I have installed. So let's look at that because I have a ton, right? So let's. I was searching. So I have a lot of packages, like a lot of them. I think it's almost a gig at this point, like just so many. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it keeps going and it keeps going and it keeps going. Okay, so there's a ton of them. Um, they don't uh, all load at the same time. Okay, so let me say this line first. So every time there's a big R update. So when you go from R three point something to R4, it will often put this in a new folder on your computer. And I think it's actually started doing this. It depends on the operating system between uh, uh, semi-major updates, like 3.6 to 3.7, it put my packages in different folders. And so once I had installed R3.7, it suddenly magically told me all my packages were gone. Okay. And that's just because it put them in a different place on your computer. <laughs> doesn't mean that they've disappeared. And I just had to reinstall them. Okay, and part of this is a, a compatibility issue. And sometimes they're not compatible with each other. So anytime you get an R update and it says that, oh, this package is gone, you're like, I swear I installed it the other day. That might be it. Okay, just reinstall it. Um, and But the thing I actually was trying to say, and this is another thing that students are often confused by, is that every time you restart R, Okay, you close R Studio and you reopen it, or you literally restart R because your computer's acting funny. You will have to reload all of those packages. Okay, so back to my comment here, and I'm like, well, good grief, I have so many. If I told all of them to load, I would be here till next Christmas. And it just was Christmas this time, right? So having these all open at the same time is gonna cause a lot of conflicts because some people name things the same thing in multiple packages, okay? So like our my my mini meltdown or in the last video over the view function, right? Um, there's another one called alpha that sometimes uh, is, in, is in a plotting package and in a package I use for a lot of statistics. If I have them open at the same time, they fight over who wins, who gets to be the alpha, <laughs> which is not meant to be a joke, but it was. Um, so, you don't want them to all load. Plus it takes up a lot of memory and a lot of resources. So anytime R opens, it opens with base R, okay? And that can be confusing to people because I have the package, it's there on my computer, I can see it. Why is it not working, right? So let's say I tried to use something from the psych package, which is parallel analysis, for example. Okay, nothing's happening, I can't get it to come up. Well, that's because I forgot to turn psych on. If I told it, okay, fine, load the psych package. Now I can see fa.parallel. Can't remember if it's parallel with three A's or not. <laughs> Thank goodness for tab, right? And so it didn't know what it was at first because I didn't have that package turned on. So every time you uh, restart R, you have to reload any packages you want to use. Okay? 
And that's why you will see in many of my examples that I will always put all of the libraries right at the top. As I do this in some of my other classes, assignments too, where I force the students to load every library at the top. Because if somebody else is looking at your code, they can see right at the top, like here are all the things that I need to make your code work. I haven't done that in any of these lectures just yet, um, but there is a cool functionality in our studio where if you load some script or some markdown, it actually searches for all the library commands and tells you which ones you don't have installed, which is pretty cool. Okay. And so you have to load a package. To load a package, you don't say like package. Unfortunately, like why did they do this differently? You do library, car. Okay. So package and libraries mean the same thing, okay. but to load them, you do library and then the name of the package. Now let's finish this out with a couple just like odds and ends here of functions. We've talked about functions this whole time, but just kind of really solidify that knowledge. A function is a pre-written code block that helps you do something. Okay, so the length function counts. The mean function calculates the mean. Okay. To get help with functions, you can do that question mark okay. or um, help the help uh, function does this. So I could do help lm. Okay. And that shows me all of the arguments. This dot, dot, dot thing is a little annoying, but we'll cover that more later. Um, this basically says, oh, there's some other things, but I'm not gonna tell you what they are right here. <laughs> I'll tell you where they are later somewhere else. Um, and it also will sometimes, if it's a good written documentation, we'll show you what you get back. So here are the things that you can put in and here are the things you're gonna get back. Not all of them do that, but most, a lot of them do that are, that are good. Now, um, some other cool things that I can do to kind of help myself learn functions, because to me, like, for example, I was learning how to do like fairly complex um, latent class growth analysis. So figuring out like how people change over time and grouping them into little groups. Okay. So this is a complex, what's called a mixed model. And I'm looking at the documentation and I'm just like, I... What? <laughs> so thankfully they had multiple examples and I finally like the little wheels click together, right? So you can use the arcs function to see what the arguments are. This is what happens when you push tab and you get the little yellow box. Okay. You can see what they are. If they have something like this, that means they have a default. So if you don't type this one in, it has a default of false. And then you can do example and it will show you an example. Okay, I don't actually love looking at the examples here. I like looking at them at, they're always at the very bottom of the help. Okay. Because from here, I can like copy them a little better. Okay. So I could copy this, except the word examples here, open it up, print it out and put it in the, um, whatever this word is, <laughs> console. I got a little mad at me about the plot, but it will run that whole example. And that's one of the things that if it's a cram package is required, your examples have to run. So that's one of the rules for it to be a cram package. If you have an example, it has to run properly. Okay. Meaning it doesn't give an error message. Okay. And then it always printed them all out down here. So this is that example. You could also write your own functions. And so that sounds daunting at first, but we'll do a couple of examples of those when we get to our data screening section. And you basically can just make up whatever you like. So we're gonna make up a pizza function here. Okay. So the name here, then I'm gonna say, okay, it has one argument X. Okay. Then inside the curly brackets, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna square X. So our pizza function here is just squaring are any value that comes in. And so I could say pizza of three and it gives me a nine. Now you gotta be careful because you have not defined any rules. So what if I did pizza of cheats? Okay. And so it says non-numeric argument to binary operator. Okay, you didn't tell it to print that out but because you tried to do cheese raised to the power of two 
somewhere in the background on base R, they've said, don't mix character vectors. Like, don't do that. That's wrong. Okay. And so one of the things I've talked about a little bit off and on is like, if the person who wrote the package did a good job, you can understand the error message. But this error message, non-numeric argument to binary operator. Well, what have we learned? We've learned about how you can't mix numbers and characters. So non-numeric argument implies that you're trying to do something numeric to a not number. And so you have to go back and figure out what thing you tried to put in was not a number. Well, the word cheese is not a number, so there's my problem. Okay. And so many packages have these kind of helpful error messages and sometimes they don't and you're left kind of working backwards from um, your sort of best guess because of the ba it, it defaulted to whatever the base R error message was. That's why I said X is not numeric, doesn't always mean X is not numeric. It means somewhere something went wrong and that's the best guess that base R had for the, for the error message. And then just a couple example functions. One of my favorites is table. Table creates you a frequency table. It just counts up the number of whatever the number of objects is. So I counted up the number of each type of species in our penguins data set. The summary function, which is the workhorse of the R library, where um, in this case, it calculated, since it's a numeric vector, it calculated the min, the max, first and third quartile. If you don't know what those are, you will in a couple of weeks, median and the mean. Basically gave me some simple descriptive statistics and the number of missing data points. If I do the summary of a character vector, it says character. I don't know, what do you want me to do? <laughs> okay. um, here's the mean function. Make this a little bigger. Now that mean function, what it does is it calculates the mean. Okay, cool. If there's a missing data point, it just goes, eh, I don't know what to do with this. Have missing back. So anytime you have missing data, you really have to like sit down and think about what am I going to do with this missing data? Okay. And so our mean function here returned NA because that bill length has two missing data points. Okay. So to get back to this number here, what I have to do is figure out the special rules for the missing data exclusion in the mean function. Okay. Most numeric calculators have some sort of exclusionary argument, not all of them, but many of them do. Okay. And often they're NARM for should I remove the NAs, question mark, or NA omits or NA action. There's a couple different options. NARM is a really popular one. As a true false, true, remove the NA values, false, don't. If I say true, then I actually get a number. So that's the mean minus those NAs. The correlation function, and so here I'm going to cal calculate the correlation of bill length, bill depth, and flipper length. Okay. Remember, this is subsetting, so we're try I'm trying to build here <laughs> on everything we've done. Now, correlation argument should calculate the correlation between these. Okay. Oh, man, I got back in A's. Okay. Unfortunately, it's not NARM. There is a couple different options, but the main one that we're going to teach you is use. So what should I do? Should I use complete OBS? Pairwise complete OBS, which is the option I've picked here. And I don't even remember what the other one is. Let's go see. So let's do question mark core. No, core. Thank you. Scroll, 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 scroll. Oh, it does have an NARM. Well, I lied to you. Maybe it doesn't. Hmm. We'll try it here in a second. So use is the main one I use. All OBS, everything, complete OBS, NA or complete or pairwise OBS. So you can play around and see which one gives you the right answer or gives you the answer <laughs> numbers, right? So let's see, no, maybe no one right answer. All right, I did not think it had an NARM. Let's see, yep, okay. So one tricky component here is that some of these packages, this was not, I didn't mean to talk about this, but we'll do it anyway, is that this is the function for core. 
but this also is the description for two other options called var for variance and cove for covariance. And so I just like completely skipped over this critical component here and went down to arguments. NARM exists, but it only exists for the var function. So see here, okay. It does not exist for the core function. So I have to tell it use instead. And so you have to be careful because sometimes they define multiple um, functions together because these are all variations on a theme mathematically um, where covariance is unstandardized correlation, but it has slightly different arguments. Okay. But let's try a different argument. So I have pairwise complete. Penguin's not fine. Oh, right. Uh, ping, Palmer. There we go. And then let's load that penguins library to set. penguins data set. Let's try our core again. So we got some numbers. Now let's try complete ops. And we'll get slightly different numbers, maybe. So if our missing data was in a specific pattern, we might get different numbers here. Okay, so we could try the different options and see kind of what's happening in the background. All right, some other description, descriptive functions that you'll see coming up in the next couple of weeks. That's cove for covariance, var for variance, SD for standard deviation, scale for z-scores. These are all sort of our basic descriptive statistics that we'll start in on with our like intro to stats part, okay, instead of intro to R. And I wanna wrap this whole set up. So what all have we learned? Like, can I code yet? Yeah, a little bit, and that's great because that's the best place to start. Okay. And so in this demonstration, across all three videos, what we've learned is some just like basic terminology. What is an object? What is a value? What is a function? Okay. What is an argument? Some very specific R related issues, the view function <laughs> versus um, you know, working directories and uh, some, you know, default kind of R stuff. They don't always load all the packages, that kind of thing. Okay. Some example functions and their use cases. So we looked at, you know, the mean, we looked at STR and what is a list and what is a vector. Okay. Now, how do I get started? Well, practice. Okay. How people ask me all the time, like, oh, you're so good at this. You must be a genius. I'm like, Nope, nope. I have R Studio open. I, I wish sometimes I had a really great graphic of like the activity monitor on my computer of how much I use R Studio. I have R open all day. That's what I do for my job. So that's part of it. But like if you're wanting to learn, you gotta practice. That's the real way of learning, which is one reason why we're doing a special flipped class because me yapping does not mean that you're practicing. Okay, and so we're going to work together this semester to really learn how to work through those errors, have those frustrations where someone who knows what's happening can go, yeah, yeah, that happens all the time. Here's what the answer is. Okay. And so, um, you know, practice, practice with Squirrel Stats. If you like Twitter, join um, and start following some of these R Stats gurus. <laughs> Not me, um, but some of these RSATs folks, I follow our ladies so I can learn new things all the time, which is a really very friendly community who will help you. If you have an RSATs question, you can tag it with RSATs, like so hashtag RSATs, and the very helpful RSATs bot will retweet it and somebody might answer your question. Okay? Or they might tell you to Google it, <laughs> but practicing is really the only way. Have a goal in mind as well. So I started learning R and became better at it because I always had some sort of goal, okay? We hit a point in our research team where we could no longer analyze what we needed to analyze in SPSS. It just literally would not run because it couldn't handle the handle what we were doing. I said, oh, I guess we're gonna have to learn this R thing everybody's talking about. And that has started a very long chain and career <laughs> of being fascinated and really excited about this sort of stuff. And so the way I learned was I needed to finish this project. Okay. For you guys, it's finishing this class, but 
every week we're going to have some sort of goal. Let's learn how to analyze a t-test. Okay, it gives you some practical goal in mind. And so for me, anytime I'm trying to learn a new skill set, like Python, when I started learning Python, I had a goal. Well, I want to teach my students how to do this in R and in Python. So how do I do the mean, for example, in Python? So I have a tangible goal. And so if you're one of these folks that are just watching this because you want to learn, that's what I would suggest is have some sort of meaningful goal set and don't make it too hard at the beginning. <laughs> don't start by learning mixed models, which is what we did um, because I'm pretty sure we had no idea what we were doing, but having a goal, like I want to, I want to participate in tidy Tuesday is an easy goal as well, where you can learn how to create, you know, this graph on this new data set. And so you can Google Tidy Tuesdays to kind of learn a little bit more about that. And those give you tangible things to practice on. So practice, practice, practice. And then I'll see you next week when we start learning the, some basic intro uh, statistical concepts for our now intro to stats.